meeting and was making his way home. He got on the train and the only seat left was beside a young boy who looked to be no older than possibly 16 years of age. The preacher sat down beside the boy desiring to be friendly. He made some remark about the weather but the boy didn't answer him. They rode along a little while together and the preacher heard the boy give a sob. He turned to him and saw he was crying, and he said, Son, you don't have to tell me your trouble if you don't want to, but I'm a preacher, and maybe if you told me, I could help you. The boy looked at him and said, Sir, I've just got to tell somebody. I've got to talk about it. And he said, about eight months ago, I got so mean that my mom and daddy couldn't stand me. He said, preacher, I, I got so bad that I actually struck my father and he run me off. But he said, a few days ago, I was in a revival meeting and God saved me. And the first thing I thought of when I got up off of my knees, I want to go home. I want to ask Daddy to forgive me. I wrote Dad a letter, and I told him I'd be on this train. And if he'd forgive me, if he wanted me to come back home, I'd get off. But if he didn't want me no more, I'd keep on going. The preacher looked at him and said, Son, how will you know whether or not your daddy wants you? But he said, Preacher, we live right alongside the railroad track, and there's an old apple tree out in our backyard. I told Dad, if he'd forgive me, just to tie a white rag in the old apple tree and I'd see it and get off. But if I didn't see it, I'd keep going. They came to a curve in the road, and the boy hung his head and started to cry. He said, Preacher, we're just about there, and I can't look. I'm afraid they don't want me no more. The preacher laid his hand on the boy's shoulder and said, Son, don't you worry. I'll look for you. I'll be your eyes. He wiped the steam from the window. He mustn't fail. But, friends, he didn't have to worry. A half blind man could have seen that apple tree. There wasn't one rag, but at least 50 white rags tied onto that old apple tree. The preacher was crying by this time. He pulled the boy over to the window. He said, son, look at there. The old apple trees all bloomed out. And sure enough, it was. They got just a little bit closer. There standing on one side of the apple tree stood an old gray-haired daddy. On the other side stood an old gray-headed mother. And they had a big sheet in their hand. And they was waving that big sheet back and forth with all their might. Friends, that was just a sign that they had forgiven. You know, I'm glad the cross of Calvary is a sign that God will forgive us if we'll only come home. Come in.
tell the story of the little pair of half-worn shoes And why it stirs my deepest feelings more than any other thing can do Listen, and when I've finished, I don't doubt but you'll agree Nothing on earth could be more precious than these little shoes to me Years ago when we were married Me and Mary, well, she's my wife Ever seen things seem bright before us Most too bright to last through life we were poor when first we started, and as I worked each day, she was saving every penny and laying it away. And when the day was over and the work was done, she would meet me at the doorstep with a kiss of tender love. And then one day a sweet girl baby was sent to us from heaven above. She came to bind our hearts still closer with a golden chain of love. How we argued what to name her. Till I settled it by saying, well, name her for my wife. How we watched the little darling trained her tiny feet to walk. And how proud we were and happy when she first began to talk. How we talked and planned together when she'd be a woman grown. And repay with interest all the kindness we'd shown. But God's plan and ours are different. For when she was but three years old, death stepped in and took our darling to the blessed master's fold. All the world seemed plunged in darkness. Both our hearts seemed turned to stone. When we saw our baby buried and we too were left alone. But at length the sorrow lifted and again we toiled and saved. And the larger grew our fortune all the more we grasped and craved. And finally we both decided, as we had saved quite a pile, we'd move into the city where we could live in easy style. So we rented out the homestead and bought us a house in Lawton Town. And we thought we'd be so happy when we got all settled down. But it wasn't long before a coolness seemed to come between us two. And we kept the thing a-going in spite of all that we could do. No, we never quarreled. Though we couldn't quite agree, she'd get pouty without any reason. And I guess it was the same with me. And the neighbors kept the thing a-going worse with her Satan hints to Mary about getting a divorce. And they kept the thing a-going till it almost broke her heart. Then one day we both decided it'd be best for us to part. No, we didn't want a lawyer or any papers to sign, for what we both had earned together was hers as well as mine. So I figured up the property, and I tried to do it square, and I figured so that Mary would receive the largest share. Then while looking through some other things that long had been laid aside, there were yet some little trinkets that she said we should divide. Something in the line of keepsake, so we wouldn't quite forget that we once had loved each other, and we ought to do so yet. And while looking through a bureau drawer, suddenly there came to view, almost hidden in a corner, was that little pair of high-form shoes. It was the shoes our baby Mary wore the last time she walked about. They were ripped across the upper and the sole was almost worn out. And when she died, we put it with other things away. And there it lay almost forgotten till we found it there that day. While my eyes were dimmed with teardrops that I thought forever dried, suddenly I heard a sobbing sounded closely by my side. I knew it was Mary sobbing. Knew her tears were falling fast. Knew that she, like me, was thinking of the times forever past. Then I turned where she was standing and the pleading look she gave shall not ever be forgotten till I'm lying in my grave. Did we stop to talk the matter over and decide what was best? No, we didn't stop for talking. But I caught her to my breast. And our teardrops fell together. And the old love came back anew while we both pressed loving kisses on that little pair of pipe-worn shoes. Then we rented out the property and we moved back to the farm. And the old love never leaves us, for we keep it growing warm. But if, if ever it should fade, it would brighten up anew if we think for just a moment of that little pair of half-worn shoes. The 
Bible says to bring up a child in the way that it should go, and when it's older, it won't depart from it. I want to tell you about a mother who brought up her child in the way he should go. A mother who was a good Christian mother. She loved God, and she raised a boy in a Christian home. And this boy knew right from wrong. His mother shed many a tear for him, prayed many a prayer for him, carried many a burden for her son. And yet, for some reason or another, no one seems to know why, this mother couldn't win her boy to Christ when he was young. The boy seemed to be a wayward boy. He knew his mother loved the Lord. He had heard her pray many prayer for him, but for some reason or another, he just wouldn't get right. This boy grew up and had to go into the service of our country. He went into the Air Force and became a, a pilot in a fighter plane. Every time this young boy got in that old plane and flew off on a mission, every time he got in battle, every time the enemy got close, he knew he had a mother back home praying for him. Mother's prayers meant more to him then than they ever had in his life. One day, this boy and his squadron, his buddies, was called in on a special mission. While they were on this mission, they had contact with the enemy, and the boy's plane was shot. The plane began to lose altitude. He knew he was going to crash. This young boy bowed his head there in the plane and remembered Mother's God and began to pray. And then he got on the radio and he called one of his buddies in another plane. He told his buddy, he said, I'm going down. My plane's going to crash. But he said, before I crash, he said, I want you to take a message. He said, I want to send a message back home to Mother. He said, be sure she gets it. As that old plane began to go down, here's the message that this young boy told his buddy to take back home and give to his mother. Hell, mother, I'll be there in answer to her prayer. Just tell my darling mother I'll be And then everything was silent as the old plane plunged into the ocean. The room was so cold and cheerless and bare, with its rickety table in one broken chair, with its curtainless windows with hardly a pane to keep out the snow, the wind, and the rain. A cradle stood empty, pushed up to the wall, and somehow, friends, that seemed the saddest of all. In the rusty old stove, the fire was dead. There was snow on the floor at the foot of the bed, and there all alone a pale woman was lying. You need not look twice to see she was dying, dying of want, of hunger and cold. Shall I tell you the story, the story she told? No, ma'am, I'm no better. And my cough is so bad, it's wearing me out though, and that makes me glad. For it's worrisome living when one's all alone, and heaven, they tell me, is just like a home. Yes, ma'am, I've a husband and he's somewhere about. I hoped he'd come in before the fire went out, but I guess he's gone, for he's likely to stay. I mean to the drinking house over the way. It was not always so, and I hope you won't think. Too hard of him, lady, for it's only the drink. I know he's kind-hearted for old Harry Crowd, for our poor little baby the morning he died. You see, he took sudden and grew very bad, and we had no doctor for my poor little lad, for his father had gone, never meaning to stay, I'm sure, to the drinking house over the way. And when he came back, was far in the night, and I was so tired and sick with fright of staying so long with my baby alone and it cut in my heart with its pitiful moan. He was cross with a drink, poor fella, I know. It was that, not his baby that bothered him so, but he swore at the child as crying it lay and he went back to the drinking house over the way. I heard the gate slam and my heart seemed to freeze like ice in my bosom and there on my knees by the side of the cradle all shivering I stayed I wanted my mother 
I cried and I prayed. The clock had struck two ere my baby was still. And my thoughts went back to my home on the hill where my happy childhood had spent its short days. Far, far from the drinking house over the way. Could I be the girl I the heartbroken wife there watching alone while that dear little life was going so fast? I had to bend low to hear if he breathed was so faint and so slow. Yes, it was easy his dying. He just grew more white and his eyes opened wider to look for the light. As his father came in, it was just break of day as he came in from the drinking house over the way. Yes, ma'am. He was sober at least mostly, I think. He often stayed that way to wear off the drink. And I know he was sorry for what he had done, for he set a great store by our first little one. And straight did he come to the cradle bed for our baby, so pretty and fair, lay dead. I wondered that I could have wished him to stay, for there was a drinking house over the way. He stood quite a while. He didn't understand. You see, till he touched the cold little hand. Oh, then came the tears and he shook like a leaf. He said it was the whiskey that made all the grief. The neighbors were kind and the minister came and he talked of me seeing my baby again. And of the bright angels, I wondered if they could see the drinking house over the way. And I thought when my baby was put in the ground and the men with the spades were shaping the mound, if somebody only would help me to save my husband who stood beside of the grave. If only we're not so handy to drink. The men that make laws, ma'am, surely they didn't think of the hearts they would break, of the souls they would slay when they license the drinking house over the way. I've been sick ever since and it cannot be long. Be pitiful, lady, to him when I'm gone. He wants to do right, but you never can think how weak a man grows when he's fond of a drink. And it's tempting him here and it's tempting him there. Why, four places I've counted in this very square where a man can get whiskey by night or by day, not to mention the drinking house over the way. There's a verse in the Bible the minister read, no drunkard shall enter the kingdom, it said. And he's my husband, and I love him so, and where I'm going, I want him to go. Our baby and I will both want him there. Don't you think the dear Savior will answer your prayer? And please, when I'm gone, ask someone to pray for him at the drinking house over the way. Friends, you've heard the saying many times, only one life, and it'll soon be past. But what we do for Jesus is all that'll last. I want to tell you a story we heard in one of our meetings recently about a little girl. This little girl was only 12 years old, and yet she had to do the work of a full-grown woman. You see, her mother took sick and passed away, and left this little girl with just her dad and five little brothers and sisters. The dad was poor, he couldn't afford to hire anybody to come in and do the housework and take care of the children. So this little 12-year-old girl, she quit school and took over the household chores. She helped take care of those little brothers and sisters and that dad. Cooked for them, did the washing, the ironing, the housework. From morning till night, it would seem like it was just work all the time. Her daddy had to work and make a living. Somebody had to take care of the family. After two years of this, the little girl had just about worked herself to death. She got a terrible disease and was put on her bed to die. The doctors had shook their head and said there wasn't anything else they could do. A lady from the church nearby went to see her one day. She walked in the room where the little girl was laying on her bed. She began to talk to her about the Lord, began to talk about heaven, tried to comfort her. And all of a sudden, this little girl looked up at her and tears began to roll down her face. The lady looked at her and said, Honey, what's wrong? She said, I know I'm going to die. 
And she said, I, I'm not dreading death so bad. Said, I know I've been saved. I know that Jesus came into my heart. And I know I'm ready to go. But she said, I dread to face him. And the woman said, why, honey? She said, I ain't done nothing for him. He done so much for me, and I ain't had a chance to do anything for him. And I, I hate to face him. And that woman looked at that little girl laying on that bed, her little body broken, twisted with pain. And she looked down at those little hands. Those little hands that was rough and scarred and red and tender. Those little hands that looked like the hands of an old woman. Those little hands that had cooked and worked and slaved to help those little brothers and sisters. The woman looked at her and she said, Honey, said when Jesus comes to take you home, so when you walk down those streets in glory and you come before him face to face, said don't worry about what you've done, what you haven't done. Said when you stand before him, you don't have to say a word. Said, Honey, just show him your hands. A boy had been drafted and was leaving for service. His mother went with him to catch the boat. As he started to board the boat, the mother said, Son, I've got something I want to tell you and something I want to give you. And she reached in her handbag and pulled out a little Bible. She handed it to him. She said, Son, I want you to always remember this. If you're ever in trouble, remember Mother's God. A few months later, the boy was assigned to a submarine. And during battle, the submarine was hit and sunk. And it was laying on the bottom of the ocean. They tried every way to get the engines to run, but they couldn't get them started. They thought they were going to die. The commander called all the boys into the room and he said, Fellows, this is it. We're going to die. The engines won't start. He said, I've got some pills I'm going to pass out. I want each of you to take one of them. It's a painless way to die, but it's better than smothering to death in this submarine. The boy, as he stood there, he thought of what his mother said. Son, if you're ever in trouble, remember Mother's God. And he said, sir, before you give out the pills, can I say just a word? I'd like for us to pray. The commander asked the boys to bow their head, and they did. The young boy fell on his knees, and he got a hold of Mother's God. About that time, the old boat began to quiver, began to shake. The engine started, and it began to rise from the bottom, plumb on up to the top. When they were out in the sunshine, the boys were so happy. One of them said, let's celebrate. One said, what will we do? Somebody said, let's sing a hymn. And they started singing. Here's the song they sung. I was drifting far from the shore. Far from the peaceful shore. Sinking way down deep, never to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. And from the bottom, lifted me, now safe am I. The story goes that all the boys on the submarine were saved because one boy remembered Mother's God. In a dark and dismal alley, for the sunshine never came, dwelt a little lad named Tommy, sickly, delicate, and lame. He had never yet been healthy, but had lain since he was born, dragging out his weak existence, well nigh hopeless and forlorn. He was six, was little Tommy. It was just five years ago since his dr uh, drunken mother dropped him and the babe was crippled so. He had never known the comfort of a mother's tender cure, but her cruel blows and curses made his pain still worse to bear. There he lay within the cellar from the morning till the night, starved, neglected, cursed, ill-treated, not to make his dull life right. Not a single friend to love him, 
nor a living thing to love, for he knew not of a savior or a heaven up above. Twas a quiet summer evening and the alley too was still. Tommy's little heart was sinking and he felt so lonely till, floating up the quiet alley, floating inward from the street, came the sound of some singing, sounded all so clear and sweet. Eagerly did Tommy listen as a singer near came, oh that he could see the singer, how he wished he wasn't lame. Then called he and shouted loudly, till the singer heard the sound, and on noting which it issued, soon the little cripple found. Twas a maiden rough and ragged, her unkept and naked feet, all her garments torn and ragged. Her appearance was far from neat. So you call me, said the maiden, wonder what you want with me. Most folks call me singing Jesse. What may your name change to be? My name's Tommy. I'm a cripple, and I want to hear you sing. For it makes me feel so happy. Sing me something, just anything. Jesse laughed and answered, smiling, I can't stay here very long, but I'll sing a hymn to please you, what I call the glory song. Then she sang the hymn of heaven, pearly gates and streets of gold. For the happy angel children are not starved or nipped with cold, but where happiness and gladness never can to cease or end, and where kind and loving Jesus is their Savior and their friend. Oh, how Tommy's eyes did glisten as he drank in every word. As it fell from singing Jesse, was it true what he had heard? And so anxiously he asked her, Is there really such a place? And a tear began to trickle down his pallid little face. Why, well, Tommy, you're a little heathen. Why, it's up beyond the sky. And if you love the Savior, you shall go there when you die. Then said Tommy, tell me, Jesse, how can I the Savior love when I'm down here in this cellar and he's up in heaven above? So the little ragged maiden who had heard at Sunday school all about the way to heaven and the Christian's golden rule taught the little cripple Tommy how to love and how to pray. Then she sang a song of Jesus, kissed his cheek, and went away. Tommy lay within the cellar which had grown so dark and cold, thinking all about the children in the streets of shining gold. And he heeded not the dankness of the damp and chilly room, for the joy in Tommy's bosom could disperse the deepest gloom. Oh, if I could only see it, thought the cripple as he lay. Jesse said that Jesus listened, so I think I'll try to pray. And so he put his little hands together and he closed his little eyes. And in accent, yet weak, yet earnest, sent this message to the sky. Gentle Jesus, please forgive me, as I didn't know before, that you cured for little cripples who are weak and very poor. And I never heard of heaven till that Jesse came today and told me all about it. So I want to try and pray. You can see me, can't you, Jesus? Jesse told me that you could, and I somehow must believe it, for it seems so prime and good. And she told me if I loved you, I could see you when I die in the bright and happy heaven that's up beyond the sky. Lord, I'm only just a cripple, and I ain't no use down here below. If I heard my mother whisper, she'd be glad to see me go. And I'm cold and hungry, and sometimes I feel so lonely too. Can't you take me, gentle Jesus, up to heaven along with you? Oh, I'd be so good and patient, and I'd never cry or fret. And your kindness to me, Jesus, I would surely not forget. I would love you all I know of, and I'd never make a noise. Can't you find me just a corner where I can watch the other boys? Oh, I think you'll do it, Jesus. Something seems to tell me so. For I feel so glad and happy, and I do so want to go. 
How I long to see you, Jesus, and the children all so bright. Come and fetch me. Won't you, Jesus, come and fetch me home tonight? Tommy ceased his supplication. He had told his soul's desire. And he waited for an answer till his head began to tire. And he turned towards his corner and lay huddled in a heap. Closed his little eyes so gently and was quickly fast asleep. Oh, I wish that ever scoffer could have seen his little face as he lay there in the corner in that damp and chilly place. For his countenance was shining like an angel fair and bright. And it seemed to fill the cellar with a holy heavenly light. Why, he had only heard of Jesus from a ragged singing girl. He might well have wondered, pondered, till his brain began to whirl. But he took it as she told it and believed it then and there. Simply trusting in the Savior and his kind and tender care. In the morning, when the mother came to wake her crippled boy, she discovered that his feature wore a look of sweetest joy, and she shook him somewhat roughly, but his little face was cold. He had gone to join the children in the streets of shining gold. Tommy's prayer had soon been answered, and the angel death had come to remove him from his cellar to his bride and heavenly home. For sweet comfort, joy, and gladness never can to cease or end. And where Jesus reigns eternally, his Savior and his friend. Friends, speaking about growing old, I want to tell you about a preacher in the hills of North Carolina, a preacher that he too was growing old. This preacher was up in years and his eyesight was just about gone. He was going blind. He had to retire from his church. He had pastored churches and preached throughout the North Carolina hills for just about all of his life. He was known far and wide for his love of Christ and his burden for lost souls. A young preacher come to take the church that he had pastored for so many years. And the first thing this young preacher wanted to do was to go out and see this old warrior of the cross. He went out to the home of this old preacher. He walked in and introduced himself and then he sat down. For a long time they talked about the Bible, talked about the work of the Lord. This young preacher, after his visit was ended, got up to leave. The old man looked over at him and said, Son, before you leave, I wonder if you'd do me one last favor. He said, my eyesight's just about gone. And I can't see to read my Bible no more. I wonder if you'd take my Bible and hand it to him. He said, I want you to read my favorite scripture to me one more time. The young man opened the Bible where he told him to, and he began to read. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. The young preacher stopped there and he began to talk about those mansions. He began to talk about heaven, about the walls of jasper, the gates of pearl, and the streets of gold. He tried to comfort him. The old man was rejoicing, tears rolling down his face. But he stopped him and said, son, so that's wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. I know it's true. But he said, that's not what I wanted to hear. He said, read on a little bit, but The young man began to read again. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. The old man stopped him and said, Son, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what thrills my soul. That's the hope I have. Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am, there you may be also. He said, that's what I'm looking forward to. Friends, even though he was old, even though he was up in years, he wasn't looking forward to dying. He was looking forward to Jesus coming back. We should look every day for Jesus to come back. That's the hope of the church. It's the second coming, the blessed hope that Jesus is soon coming back. In a land where we'll never grow. What 
blood, his blood that stained the old rugged cross. There's a certain school in this section whom no teacher could handle. The boys were so rough that the teachers would resign. A young teacher applied for the job. The old director looked at him and said, Young man, you know what you're asking for? An awful beating. Every teacher we've had for years has had to take it. The young teacher replied, Sir, I'd like to try it. In a day or so, he applied for duty. Big Tom whispered, I won't need no help. I can whip him by myself. Teacher said, boys, I've come to conduct school. And I want a good school. But I confess I do not know how unless you help me. Suppose we have a few rules. You tell me and I'll write them on the blackboard. One fella called out, no stealing. Another hollered, everybody on time. Finally, ten rules appeared on the blackboard. The teacher said, now boys, a law is no good unless there's a penalty attached for the one who breaks them. What will we do for the one who breaks the laws? Somebody called out, beat him across the back ten times without his coat on. That's pretty severe, boys. Are you ready to stand by it? Another yell and teacher said, school, come to order. In a day or so, Big Tom found that somebody had stolen his dinner. Upon inquiry, the thief was located a little hungry fellow about 10 years old. The next day, the teacher announced, the thief has been found. And he must be punished according to your rules. Ten stripes across the back without his coat on. Jim, come up here. A little fellow trimmed him came forward with a big coat facing up to his neck and pleaded, Teacher, you can whip me as hard as you want to, but please, don't make me take my coat off. Take that coat off, you help make the rules. And he began to unbutton. And what did the teacher see? The little boy didn't have no shirt on, but strings for braces over his little bony body. Jim? How come you be without a shirt? He replied, Well, I ain't got but one shirt. You see, my daddy's dead, and mommy's very poor. And today's wash day, and, and mommy's washing my shirt. So I wore my brother's big coat to keep me warm. The teacher, with hand, his head in his hands, thought, how can I whip this child? About that time, Big Tom jumped his feet and said, Teacher, if you don't care, I I'll take Jim's licking for him. Very well, there's a certain law that one can become a substitute for another. Do you all agree? And off came Tom's coat. And after five hard licks, the rod broke. The teacher hesitated, bowed his head, and he thought, how can I finish this awful job? About that time he heard the entire school sobbing. And what did he see? Little Tom had reached up with both arms and caught Jim, Tom around the neck. And he said, Tom, I'm awful sorry. I stole your dinner. Tom, I love you till I die for taking my licking for me. Yes, Tom, I'll love you forever. Friends, Christ took our place when he died on the cross. Blood is blood, his precious blood that stained the old rugged cross. Blood is blood that paid the
I have a lump in my throat, Mom, and tears brime in my eyes. My buddy's gone. I saw him fall. I even heard his cries. You'll never know how I felt, Mom, as I saw him lying there. But on his face there was a smile and on his lips a prayer. He told me just this morning, Mom, before we landed here, about his home and friends once more of memory sweet and dear. How his dad would read the Bible and his family ought to pray. And tears filled his eyes, Mom, as he said, though I'm not there, I know they kneel together each night in humble prayer. And when I go into battle, I can see them kneeling there. I know they're praying much for me, so there's no need to fear. Of course, it may not be the plan of loving God on high that I return. But if it be his will that I should die, there's no fear down in my heart. He knows what's best for me. And I know I'm ready and I want his will for me to always be. And he's gone. And still this awful battle rages here. I may be next to go. Who knows? Mom, they're falling everywhere. And oh, how much I'd give to know my family nailed each night. But I don't have the prayers back home that my dear buddy had. You write me almost every day. But mom, it makes me sad. You tell me all the little things at home that I enjoy. But never one time have you said, I'm praying for my boy. And oh, how much we need the prayers of those back home so dear. It's all that'll ever help us, mom, while we're fighting here. I guess I'm just like all the other homesick boys out here who cannot even think of one who holds him up in prayer. Oh, why do I go on like this when you're so far away? But somehow, Mom, it seems you've been so near today. So I've just opened up my heart to you all through this fight. And maybe somehow you'll know and pray for me tonight. Bible meeting we were in, an elderly man rose from his seat and gave this testimony. He said, years ago, when I was just a young man, I was engineer for a railroad company. My job was to take the old engine out every day on a certain run. And then when my day's work was through, I'd bring the engine back into the yard at close of day. And he said, as I came in to the yard, I passed by the house where my mother and daddy lived, just a little log house up on the side of the bank. And he said, every evening, when I'd get inside the house, I'd look up and see the front door open, and my mother would come to the door. And in just a second, my dad would come and stand beside her. When I got close enough that they could see it was me, My mom would turn around to dad. He said, I, I couldn't hear her. The old engine made too much noise. But I knew what she said. I could see her lips move. And she'd turn to dad and she'd say, Thank God. Jim made it home safe tonight. He said this went on for a long time. 
And finally, one day, my dad died suddenly. He said, after the funeral, I went back to my job, and I'd take that old engine out on the run, and I'd come back into the yard of the evening, I'd pace by the house. I'd look up at the door, and my mother would come at the door, and she'd look down and see that it was me. He said, I, I couldn't hear what she said. The old engine made too much noise. But he said, I knew what she was saying. He said, I could see her lips move. She'd raise her eyes to heaven. And she'd say, thank God. Jim made it home safe tonight. He said this went on for a long time. And finally, my mother got sick. I rushed home and just in time to see my mother cross over the river. Go on home to be with Jesus and to see dad again. After the funeral, I went back to my job. And he said I'd come home of the evening. I'd look up to the little house sitting on the hill. There wasn't any mother. There wasn't any daddy. The door looked lonesome. But he said, friends, praise God. I know I'm saved tonight. Someday, I'm going to pull into the great portal in the sky. My mother's going to be there. My daddy's going to be there. But best of all, Jesus is going to be there. And when I pull into the portal in the sky, my mother, she'll turn around and she'll say to Dad, Thank God, Jim made it home safe tonight. <laughs>